This unearthly device is a Grumman Lunar Module, the most specialized yet most broadly capable manned space vehicle ever built. On July 20th, 1969, a sister ship of this one, here in the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, flew from its Apollo 11 mothercraft to the surface of the moon and back again, safely carrying the first two human beings ever to set foot on a non-terrestrial surface. In 1961, when he was a young engineer of 32, Thomas J. Kelly headed the design of that remarkable machine. But America's quest for the moon actually began four years earlier, on a fateful day in 1957. I still remember when the, when the Sputnik uh, was launched, uh, which kind of uh, was a rude awakening uh, uh, for this country and uh, for me personally about the space age. When the uh, Sputnik came along, it just gave emphasis to what we were doing. And I guess uh, I personally appreciated it. It was like uh, being able to give the government a prod to do what you thought they should be doing all along. Some found consolation in the shock, but Sputnik was a public relations disaster for the United States. Yet worse was to come. First, the Soviets sent a dog into orbit, then a man. By 1961, John F. Kennedy was president. For him, the worsening situation represented a direct political challenge. We insisted that we should see the president. We felt it was an important issue. And we did see President Kennedy and he was really not prepared to make a decision on the follow-on to Mercury, which was Apollo. Even in those days, it was called Apollo. But he did agree to go ahead with it, with a with a development of the larger booster, the Saturn. And uh, and then about I would guess uh, offhand maybe three or four weeks later, cosmonaut Gagarin orbited the Earth. And at that point, uh, President Kennedy uh, realized that there was a an immediate policy issue, a paper was put together that, that uh, outlined the manned program to the moon and said that, we, that McNamara and Webb felt that that was the right goal to take, that it was an achievable goal. Well, that's the reason that we really got the program going so well, is because the people in this country thought that the Russians were ahead of us. And, and, of course, the Russians were ahead of us. On May 5th, 1961, Alan Shepard became America's first man in space. The flight was embarrassingly brief in duration, simply a ballistic lob to an altitude of 116 miles and a water landing barely 300 miles downrange. But the emotional impact was enormous. The United States allowed the world to watch, something the Soviets would never have dared. We were in the race, and exactly 20 days later, John Kennedy named the finish line. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. It was an awesome, perhaps even impossible goal, for nobody had yet seriously considered the question of exactly how to land a vehicle on the moon, or more important, get it off again. When the original idea of going to the moon was conceived, um, NASA hadn't really pinned down exactly how they were going to go to the moon. Uh, the lunar orbit rendezvous approach uh, was an alternative. I think it was a pretty ingenious alternative. Uh, the person who uh, is credited with having come up with the original ideas, John Hobolt uh, at NASA, and we read uh, one of his early papers on that, and uh, we, we checked all the calculations ourselves, and, uh, and it seemed like a pretty attractive idea to us. So we, in the final analysis, uh, the lunar orbit rendezvous approach uh, was selected because it was more economical uh, specifically, the command module could be specialized for re-entry, which was a very demanding environment and requires a uh, hard, compact, heat-resistant vehicle in order to survive, aerodynamically shaped. Um, in contrast, uh, the lunar module uh, 
was able to be specialized for operations in space and on the moon, uh, where it has no aerodynamics to contend with and uh, very little in the way of uh, forces, either gravity or, uh, or anything else. The request for bid on the lunar module was unique in my experience in that it did not uh, ask for a specific design. It was a almost like a game of 20 questions. Uh, you answer these questions and if we think you know what you're talking about, we'll talk to you later. And consequently, uh, we tried to do that. Now, to answer the questions, we had to postulate a design. And that really is what was shown in that little uh, wood model that uh, sits up there on the shelf. We thought that, uh, in effect, when we finally did uh, receive uh, indication that we were the winners, that, that we would develop that design. But it turned out that, no, we had just passed the entrance examination and that we would have to uh, uh, work with uh, the, what is now the Johnson Center to develop a design. So in effect, the preliminary design of the lunar module started from scratch after the award. That development work began in November 1962 when it was announced that Grumman had won the LEM competition. It wasn't the first time Grumman had been on the leading edge. The best analogy uh, to the problem of designing a spacecraft that uh, seemed to be a fighter airplane. We didn't know anything about space any more than uh, uh, most people did at that time. Uh, but we did know a lot about uh, producing uh, reliable flying machines that had to operate in a very hostile and demanding environment. If you think about the skills that we that we had available from the aircraft design world were very, really very directly applicable uh, to the design of the lunar module. Uh, but everything else was uh, a very logical extension of the aircraft designer's desire to go higher, faster, and farther. At regular intervals during the design of the lunar module, Grumman built full-size models of the machine. With these mock-ups, Engineers could check the fit of systems, astronauts could practice their procedures, and NASA could evaluate Grumman's progress. NASA would uh, come with literally hundreds of people. They would include all the astronauts and all the leaders uh, of the various NASA centers and, uh, and their supporting uh, uh, cast of engineers and experts. Now, in the case of the LEM, uh, the crew had a lot of contact with the LEM besides uh, just flying it from inside the crew compartment. It also served as their home base when it was on the moon, and the descent stage uh, housed all the scientific equipment. All of those aspects uh, of the LEM that the, that the crew would actually use had to be evaluated in the mock-ups. We had a, uh, a sling with a, like a big bungee that ran down from the ceiling. And what the astronaut would do would hook it onto his suit, and he would go up the ladder, e ingress and egress out of the uh, LEM. And it was quite interesting. And uh, if you ever got on one of those things, it was quite a thrill. Like jumping off of a, uh, a tree into water and then bouncing back up again. The design of the landing gear is, is uh, an interesting story in itself. Now, this, uh, this was influenced by a couple of factors. It was influenced by the theories as to what the lunar surface might consist of. They varied all the way from a very light, powdery dust into which the whole limb might sink. Uh, that was one extreme. Uh, the other extreme was that it was going to be uh, uh, ice, uh, very slippery, very hard uh, in, in uh, some areas. On a 250,000 mile trip, weight was critical. As the design developed from concept to hardware, the shape and structure changed in several significant ways. When you compare these two models, the proposal model and the, and the final version of the LEM, uh, many of the, of the differences that you see uh, 
uh, the result of our desire to save weight on the, on the lunar module. This proposal model had aircraft style seats. Uh, we realized that we really didn't need seats in uh, zero G or even one six G. So in this uh, limb and in the real limbs, uh, the crew was in a stand up position. So what we were able to do, since the crew was standing up, we were able to design it such that the window was very close to the crew's eye. And that basically cut down the glass area drastically. While the vehicle was being built in Bethpage, Grumman had to test the Lem's engines as well. The fuel was far too dangerous to mix or store anywhere short of a desert. And the desert was where Grumman went, to White Sands, New Mexico and a spear point operation, which White Sands was, because it came so far in advance of the operations at the Cape. Initially, we had to find out whether this descent engine could be fired, gimbaled, throttled, and would it, in fact, fire as long as this descent mission lasted. And we had an altitude chamber for the descent stage, and we had an altitude chamber for the ascent stage. The ascent stage was far more critical uh, in the mission than the descent stage because it had no backup. And if there was anything that had to be absolutely perfect in the lunar module, it was the ascent engine. Because if you press the button to go back out into orbit around the moon and it didn't fire, the astronauts were lost. In three wars, Grumman airplanes built a reputation for bringing their crews back alive. The Lem would, too. Each Lem would be used just once, but Grumman built them to last. The actual building was, was done in a very handcrafted, uh, customized fashion. And in many, many cases, uh, you were strictly relying on the integrity of that particular workman because after he put something together, it was very, very difficult to tell whether it had been done uh, properly or not. Consequently, when the LEM was in the factory, uh, you could hardly see it. It was surrounded by scaffolding and protective covers of all types, both externally and inside the uh, the crew compartment. We also had a rotate and clean machine, which they also called a tumbler. And what that did was, uh, I think we had three cycles of tumbling. And it took all of the debris and dust and rivets, rivet tails and what have you. And we would catch it and weigh it on a big canvas sheet. And as you progressed along better and everybody got more used to working with this type of environment, the ship became much cleaner. Here on Earth, the Lem was out of its element. Amid the bustle of a factory, the Lem was fragile, delicate. In fact, its outermost skin was a high-tech version of what people used to call tinfoil. On the surface of the moon, uh, you went from like uh, plus 250 degrees Fahrenheit in the sunlight to minus 250 in the shade. And that happened fairly abruptly. Um, the strategy, the des design strategy that we used was to wrap the lunar module in insulation so that it would be basically thermally isolated from uh, its surroundings. Now that insulation was mylar. It was uh, an aluminized mylar. The mylar itself was kind of a gold color and it's very prominent in any of the pictures of the limb uh, that you see. The only way pilots could practice maneuvering and landing the LEM was with flight simulators and awkward lunar lander rigs. Never before had a flying machine gone into actual service without a single test flight. But for the LEM, there was no other way. No other way, that is, than to test every system separately and together on the ground every step of the way. We tested at the component level, we tested at the assembly level, we tested at the subsystem level, and of course we finally tested at the, at the all-up level. And statistically, you couldn't prove reliability of the kind that we felt we had to have. So we adopted the policy that uh, there's no such thing as a random failure. 
that every failure had to be examined, had to be understood, and some action had to be taken to eliminate that cause. What made people work so hard? Certainly there were rewards for wallet, ego, and resume, but the greatest reward was that the Lem was destined for greatness, and everyone who came in contact with the spidery machine that Grumman was building knew it. There was a dedication and a, uh, and a drive on the Lunar Module program that, that I haven't uh, seen uh, equal since. I've, I've seen it equaled in very small groups, uh, but we're talking about thousands of people here that were swept up in the enthusiasm and the historic importance of this uh, endeavor. This wasn't just another flying machine. This was unusual. It had not been done before. And I think there's something that many engineers respond to in, in the sense that uh, it is at the forefront of knowledge and that there are risks being taken. You got kind of caught up into something that you had no control with. There was a um, national goal to put a man on the moon and it was something that we all just got so engrossed with and became so dedicated to or obsessed with that you would do anything you had to, um, go wherever you had to in order to get the spacecraft ready. We thought we had hyped ourselves into thinking, you know, we could do it. We believed we could do it. And there was something there, there was, some, there was a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, we could see it. We knew we were part of it and we could see the progress we were making. And then we were all 20 years younger. At that time, the, uh, the average age of the, 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 the uh, NASA and their contractors were, you know, probably around 30, 25 to 30. At that age, you believe you can do anything, you know, you can move mountains. And we actually believe that. So we're, and we got caught up in it, and it was, uh, we were addicted. We'd rather be here than go home. The spirit I saw at, uh, at Grumman in those days uh, with the limb was to uh, almost be willing to go to any end personal sacrifice and it certainly was in the uh, the hours that people were putting in and I'm sure it was hard on home life uh, to make it right. The fact is that uh, there wasn't any question in anybody's mind that we we're going to make it work, that we were not going to leave three, two astronauts on the moon and that we're going to get them back safely. Despite their indomitable spirit, at Cape Kennedy, the Grumman team were newcomers. They found themselves continually behind schedule, getting the unproven limb into the flow, on the stack, and to the moon. And we got into this uh, environment down there where uh, with the, um, the Mercury and Gemini programs preceding our Apollo program, uh, there were a lot of people uh, in the Cocoa Beach and the Cape Kennedy area that were, you know, uh, you might say uh, uh, well up on the learning curve and, and very experienced in, uh, in uh, the whole business of uh, launching vehicles and manned space flight. We were the last major, large major contractor to come on the, uh, on the team at Kennedy, uh, come on the stack, so to speak. And there was a lot of people who uh, thought that uh, uh, perhaps we didn't have it, you know, from experience and uh, just general know-how to stay up with the crowd. The Cape operation was the, uh, the last stop on the daisy chain. We at the Kennedy Space Center had the, the job of um, taking the asset and the descent stage and, and, and putting them together and doing all of the pre-launch checkout of these vehicles, uh, the asset and the descent stage, and uh, prepping them for launch. On July 16, 1969, the greatest engineering achievement in the history of mankind moved from promise to fulfillment. The entire world watched as Apollo 11 cleared the tower at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. For the men and women of Grumman, the sense of participation was strong and sweet. Buzz Aldrin, Neil Armstrong, and Michael Collins, harnessed in their seats atop this 36-story high Saturn V launch vehicle, headed for the moon a quarter of a million miles away. Reaching an escape velocity of 24,200 miles per hour, 
Apollo 11, with its three astronauts and command, service, and lunar modules aboard, was injected into its translunar trajectory. Once the accuracy of the flight path was confirmed, the panels of the spacecraft LEM adapter were opened. This allowed the command and attached service modules to separate from the third stage, rotate 180 degrees, and dock with the Eagle. As the lunar module Eagle was pulled from the third stage, Apollo 11 finally settled into its three-day voyage toward lunar orbit. As Apollo 11 neared its destination, the service module engine was reignited as a retro rocket to inject the spacecraft into a circular orbit around the moon. As it descended to 80 miles above the cratered surface, Armstrong and Aldrin worked their way through the narrow docking tunnel into the LEM and activated the environmental control system. With its landing gear deployed and landing radar tested, the Eagle used its reaction control jets to separate itself from the command module. The Eagle started down. The descent engine was throttled to regulate the speed of descent. Neil Armstrong pitched the LEM downward for a better view of the lunar terrain. Assisted by onboard computers, he guided the LEM to a level area. There were just a few feet to go to landing, but Apollo 11 was running out of fuel. Less than 40 seconds of maneuvering power left. Forward, 40 feet down, two and a half, picking up some dust. Big shadow, four forward, drift into the right a little. 30 seconds. Forward, just contact light. And then a world okay, holding its collective breath heard. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Twink. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. It wasn't until uh, some few minutes after the lunar landing when we solved a particularly pressing anomaly right after landing um, that I was able to relax a little bit and, uh, and let it sink in that uh, after all these years of uh, planning and uh, anticipation and simulation, uh, thank God we'd finally done the real thing. I can remember just being absolutely galvanized that for all these years, this is what we were coming to. This was a moment of truth. And I guess I just couldn't move. And then when the eagle has landed, I turned into... Uh, one of the many weepers that this world knew at that moment. Six and a half hours later, Neil Armstrong became the first person from planet Earth to step onto another celestial body. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Buzz Aldrin joined him, and two incredible tourists began their exploration. They gathered moon rocks and soil samples. They planted the American flag, propping it up for a wind-blown effect in the airless void. They set up solar wind and seismic experiments. And they discovered a brand new way to get around in one-sixth the gravity of Earth. Still ahead, the rendezvous with Mike Collins aboard the command module Columbia. Aldrin and Armstrong would have to launch themselves into lunar orbit and do it alone. A lot of people ask me, what, is, what was the most uh, demanding moment of that first landing mission? And to be sure, the landing was, was uh, the sort of thing that made you uh, hold the arm of the chair rather tightly. But to me, the, the takeoff was, was perhaps the most critical one because, first of all, there are only two people there getting it ready to go. And... Uh, it's one of those things where it either worked or didn't work. And it had never really been demonstrated. Had never really been demonstrated. And all the other parts of the mission, you could find a back out mode. But when you had to take off for the moon, that was it. It either worked or didn't work. Well, it worked. 
26, 36 feet per second up. When the ascent happened, I think my heart stopped. And when it was in orbit was the time that I said, yes, now, now it has happened. I was very confident that we could rendezvous with the command and service module and then get our astronauts home. And home they came to a nation whose confidence had soared to a height we've yet to surpass. sixties, uh, there was no question that uh, there was a sense of competition with the Soviets and that uh, the Apollo program was considered a, a regaining of our leadership in technology and uh, it had impacts uh, in the educational system. Uh, it inspired a whole generation of young people to be interested in high technology. Uh, it had a mission description that was fairly simple, uh, go to the moon and back in this decade, uh, that most anyone could understand. And it, it uh, really had a chord that struck the imagination of uh, not just those involved, but uh, literally any, anyone on Earth, that this was really going to be the first time people would leave the Earth. And I think by the time that uh, we landed on the moon, there wasn't any question as to who was preeminent in, in, in space technology in the world, and that was the United States. So that goal was achieved. It is hard to imagine that mankind's first landing on the moon is already ancient history. That five more followed. To some, it is the stuff of school books, the lore of elderly engineers. For others, however, it seems like yesterday. And anybody who doubts their accomplishment need only examine what they left behind. What a ride, what a ride. Uh, remember the six of these descent stages uh, today sitting on the moon, looking right like that with a grunt maiden, Beth Page, uh, New York uh, nameplate on them. And uh, that's something that uh, thousands of us Grumanites uh, take great pride in. of the moon and back again, safely carrying the first two human beings ever to set foot on a non-terrestrial surface. In 1961, when he was a young engineer of 32, Thomas J. Kelly headed the design of that remarkable machine. But America's quest for the moon actually began four years earlier, on a fateful day in 1957. I still remember when the, when the Sputnik uh was launched, uh, which kind of uh, was a rude awakening uh, uh, for this country and uh, for me personally about the space age. When the political challenge. We insisted that we should see the president. We felt it was an important issue. And we did see President Kennedy. And he was really not prepared to make a decision on the follow on to Mercury, which was Apollo. Even in those days, it was called Apollo. But he did agree to go ahead with the with with development of the larger booster, the Saturn. And, uh, and then about, I would guess, uh, offhand, maybe three or four weeks later, cosmonaut Gagarin orbited the Earth. And at that point, uh, President Kennedy uh, realized that there was a... The uh, Sputnik came along. It just gave impetus to what we were doing. And I guess uh, I personally appreciated it. It was like... Uh, uh, being able to give the government a prod uh, 
to do what you thought they should be doing all along. Some found consolation in the shock, but Sputnik was a public relations disaster for the United States. Yet worse was to come. First, the Soviets sent a dog into orbit, then a man. By 1961, John F. Kennedy was president. For him, the worsening situation represented a direct... An immediate policy issue, a paper was put together that, that uh, outlined the manned program to the moon and said that, we, that McNamara and Webb felt that that was the right goal to take, that it was an achievable goal. Well, that's the reason that we really got the program going so well, is because the people in this country thought that the Russians were ahead of us. And, and of course, the Russians were ahead of us. On May 5th, 1961, Alan Shepard This unearthly device is a Grumman lunar module, the most specialized yet most broadly capable manned space vehicle ever built. On July 20th, 1969, a sister ship of this one, here in the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, flew from its Apollo 11 mothercraft to the surface.